They did happen to uh, cover a couple of content features in the holiday session, which was on Monday of last week. Um, please be aware that the Monday of last week um, was recorded. There's a link in the weekly plan. So each weekly plan that I add, and I'll keep doing it even though we go back to school, um, I will actually put in new videos that go through content. So look forward to that, yay. Alrighty, so essentially, um, we're gonna be starting off with uh, unit three. At the end, um, I'll give you about 10, 15 minutes to ask any questions about the hurdle tasks um, and we'll see how we go. All right, so let me, they changed things. I like it, I like it. All righty, so, nope, not that one. I need this one. Um, can someone please tell me if they can see the screen? Yep. Cool. All righty. So I'll get through and what I'll do for those people who weren't here after um, a certain topic, I'll ask if there's any questions. I'll try to relate it to the exam. Um, I'm trying to find different ways of teaching this, but we'll see how we go. All right. So unit three. You'll notice and Hayley was the one who got me on this before. Hopefully. Oh, let's see if we can get there. All right. Um, I've uploaded the um, the 2019 exam. You should at this point be doing at least one practice exam per week for all your subjects, at least. Um, what you should be doing if I've already given you one practice exam, I have only seen two people that have actually um, done it, but still. So with the practice exam, the first two that you do should be open book and you can take your time with those. That's fine. What you do is you do them open book and then you go through the answers. All right. And once you go through the answers, you work out what you got incorrect or you've written poorly, whatever, and you rewrite it or do the content again. Right, and you study it again and you go, well, I didn't get nervous system correct. I'm going to revise that. Right, so you do that for the first two and then with the third one and onwards, you start doing them closed book and you do them timed. And you should have, a, you know, a clock, not my one, but you should have like a, um, an analog clock. That's the one with the hands, by the way, right? and have it there available. Even if you have your phone that goes, all right, 15 minutes time. I actually set my Google Assistant thingamajig to give me, oh, don't talk, um, to give me alarms of when 15 minutes have passed or when half an hour. Get your phone to do that as well. Um, so you know you should be at this point at this point. Anyway, get into that. Um, so you keep doing it again and again and again and again and again. You learn more through practice exams and going through content, but you need to know the content to do the practice exam. So it's a bit of a all over the place sort of thing. Alrighty, so back to this one. Does anyone have any questions about my crazy methods? No? Okay. Alrighty. So we'll just yeah. All right. So unit three, the first topic that we did was nervous system functioning. Um, you need to make sure that you know how the nervous system actually um, communicates throughout your body, how it processes information, how it receives it, and how it coordinates it. So you need to know how first it gets the information, how it processes it, and how it tells well the brain tells the rest of the body to do something you need to know the subsystems so you need to know this particular diagram so you need to know about um, how the nervous system breaks up into the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system um, so central nervous system breaks down into the brain and spinal cord the peripheral nervous system is the autonomic and somatic with the autonomic breaking down further into the sympathetic and parasympathetic you need to know this. They won't ask you specifically to do like a diagram sort of thing, but they will ask you to um, 
at least outline all right so where does well uh, let's say so the sympathetic nervous system is it autonomic or somatic you need to know that sort of stuff all right so the central nervous system sends and receives messages to and from the pns make sure you know the fact that it's to and from uh, and it's broken down to the brain so it processes sensory information and the spinal cord so it connects the brain to the pns um, and it receives information from the pns and sends it up to the brain or up through the spinal cord and receives motor information from the brain so the brain's telling your body to move right and it sends it to various parts of the body so it's all done through the spinal cord the peripheral nervous system it is associated with all the nerves that are inside the body and outside uh, carries information to the CNS and carries motor information from the CNS. So you need to know this section here, right? So the CNS carries sensory information to the CNS, so the brain and the spinal cord, and motor information from the CNS, so from the brain and spinal cord down to the rest of the parts of the body. So the autonomic nervous system connects the CNS to internal organs and glands. Um, it's self-regulating and automatic, so it's not under voluntary control. So the reason why it says autonomic is because it's happening automatically, right? So we have no control over it. It's the internal organs. It's, you know, um, without having to think about it, our um, heart still beats, our breathing still well, our lungs still breathe, all that sort of stuff. So it's self-regulating, it's um, automatic. You have no control over stopping it or starting it. It just happens. You may be able to regulate it, but you cannot control it. Alrighty, so it regulates the muscles controlling organs, so the visceral muscles. So we're talking about the muscles around the heart, around various organs. Um, the somatic nervous system, is all to do with the S, so the skeletal movements. So these are the muscles, so me doing this, that's the somatic nervous system, right? So it carries sensory information to the CNS, so if I touch something, right, that's going to be sending the information elsewhere. And then it carries motor information from the CNS, so um, it's making sure that the brain connects to the rest of the body. So the autonomic nervous system breaks down into the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. The most common question that gets asked in the exam is about this stuff here, right? So it's asking about the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And usually it asks things like, where does the flight, fight, freeze response come in, right? Um, what is the bodily reactions in the sympathetic nervous system or the parasympathetic nervous system? So you need to make sure you know this. So the sympathetic nervous system essentially turns on the flight, fight, freeze response. It prepares the body for action. So it increases most of your, um, your muscles, your organs and glands, and it stimulates them in preparation to fight or flee or to do anything. Right? It's usually triggered by a stress response. So when you get to around the exams, there's a good chance the sympathetic nervous system is going to click on, right? There is a release of hormones um, such as adrenaline, especially if you need to run away from something or if you're afraid of something. Um, heart rate and breathing rate increases. A bunch of other things also increase. There have been a few questions which ask about, um, you know, what increases during the sympathetic nervous system and what decreases during the parasympathetic nervous system. So you need to make sure you know the bodily functions that happen in those two. So the parasympathetic nervous system decreases activity. It kind of turns off the flight, fight, freeze response. So it's calming the body, right? It dominates the sympathetic nervous system most of the time. So Right now, if you're having, okay, yes, it's a little stressful going back to school, but right now you should be in the pa parasympathetic nervous system. That's what should be um, functioning right now, right? Unless, of course, you've got a sack in, you know, half an hour, then, yeah, sympathetic may be turned on. 
Um, it takes longer to return the body to its normal state as it has to remove um, all the hormones from the bloodstream. So the sympathetic nervous system will turn on if you're afraid or if you're, you know, running from something. But it might take, let's say, a, um, a couple of hours, a couple of minutes, depending on how much adrenaline and hormones were actually released for it to go back to a parasympathetic nervous system. And sometimes they call this returning the body to homeostasis. So you're returning the body back to normal. All right. Does anyone have any questions about what was discovered for that bit? No? Yes? Okay. Very helpful, people. Very helpful. Okay. So, you need to know about the conscious and unconscious responses of the nervous system. The major one that comes out, though, is the spinal reflex. So a conscious response is something that you do. So me putting my hands all over the place, that's a conscious response. That is voluntary. I don't have to do it, but I do it. Um, and it usually happens after I've paid attention to a stimulus. So let's say, for example, I happen to notice someone walking past my window. I voluntarily move my head to look at it. Right? This is a conscious response. And unconscious response is something that doesn't include awareness and you see the word awareness you need to make sure that you actually include that so if they're talking about um conscious and unconscious you need to include in your answer at some point the word awareness all right it is involuntary and automatic so let's say for example um, you happen to have, I don't know, a puff of air blown in your face. The blinking response would be unconscious, right? Sometimes it might be um, a reflex that occurs. These are all unconscious responses. It's something that you do automatically without having to think about it. A spinal reflex is when there is no time for the brain to actually um, process it and it's done automatically through the um, through the interneurons. So spinal reflex is unconscious, it is involuntary, and it occurs automatically to certain stimuli. Usually it's something that is, you know, painful or something that will cause you danger, um, like standing on something, and I'm working on something at the moment that may explain this a little bit better, but we'll get to that. Um, Essentially, the sensory information goes through to the spinal cord, right? And then that information through the motor neurons sends information back and says to withdraw your hand or your foot or whatever, and it allows for a faster reaction time and is essentially an adaptive response. So your body has learnt to adapt to a survival situation. More often than not, the spinal reflex is for harmful situations, right? Things that will put you in danger. Kids do it. All right. So let's say, for example, this is the best one that I can come up with, right? It is a good diagram. I recommend copying and pasting this into your notes if you've not already got it. So what's going to happen is you've got the pain receptors in the skin, you'd feel the hot object. So let's say you're going to touch a flame. What's going to happen is the sensory receptors in your finger are going to go down here and the sensory neurons or the afferent neurons, remember same, right, are going to send the message through my arm, right, to my spinal cord. And in the spinal cord is the interneuron. And see how it's got here, that little red one there? That's the interneuron, right? The interneuron recognises that this is dangerous, right? So because it's dangerous and it could cause you potential harm, remember the survival adaptive response, right? It's going to forget, well, not forget, it's going to forego sending it to the brain just yet, right? what's going to happen is it's going to send the motor neuron or the interneuron 
send a message to the motor neuron, right, which is the blue one there, and it's going to send a message back through my arm, down to my finger, and say, oh, move your arm away. All right, so it's sending messages to the muscles in my arm to move it. And these are the efferent neurons. All right, so an efferent neuron sends the message to the muscle and it contracts away from the hot object. The spinal reflex is very, very important to remember. So make sure that you remember that one. All righty, so can, this is, oh no, wait, I've got one here. Um, so to remember the order of um, the spinal reflex, I um, use the mnemonic RACI. It helps. So you get the receptor, which is the receptor in your fingers, then the afferent or sensory neuron, right? Then goes to the center of the spinal cord, which is the interneuron, right? Then you get the efferent neuron and the effector, which you're effectively removing um, your arm from the uh, response or the stimuli. Okay, I think that's the last that it is. Okay, does anyone have any questions about um, what I just covered then? Spinal reflex, very important. No, thank you. No, thank you? Okay, I appreciate you. Alrighty, so, hope I'm not going too fast, but I want to get through as much as possible. Um, so, we're going through it. All right, nervous system functioning. So, we did this a little in year 11 psychology, right? It's talking about the neuron and you need to know the parts of the neuron, but mainly how it actually is um, transmitted and the how what each of them does. And that's why we spent so much time on it in year 11. So the direction of the neuron goes from, oh, what am I doing? From this end to, so from the left to the right, depending on wherever it is, but you see where I'm going with this. All right, so you need to know how it transmits and processes information throughout the neuron. So it starts off from the dendrites. So the dendrites pick up information from a, a presynaptic neuron, right? And it sends it down to the, uh, to the soma and to the nucleus. Then what happens is this information then gets passed along the axon, which is all this section here, right? And the myelin sheets actually um, insulate that information and prevents it from getting lost or um, from deteriorating as it passes through. So it's making sure that it actually gets to where it's going. Once it gets through the axon, and it speeds up each time it has to go through the nodes of Ranvia, which is not on this message, but never mind. I, it then goes to the axon terminals. And these axon terminals at the very end have a synapse. And through the synaptic gap, they pass to the next neuron through the dendrites and it just passes on and passes on. And this is happening in a fraction of a second. So it's very, very quick and usually um, the more you go over it, the better. So let's put it this way. If you're studying your psychology notes, what's going to happen is you're going to have, right, you're going to go through something that you know, maybe the neuron, right? And because you're learning about the neuron for like the 20th time today, right, you, the neurons in your brain are going to be speeding up and getting faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And faster. Right, and we're talking about long term potentiation here, um, but it just gets faster and faster as you go. And as you do it again and again and again, the myelin sheath actually gets um, thicker and stronger. Also, what happens if you start to um, pair it with examples? So, for example, you might pair it with long term potentiation, you might learn uh, or long term depression, whatever it's going to form new connections with other neurons. So it's very important to know. So parts of the neuron. Um, so essentially, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this. You can read this so you can pause whatever. Um, but essentially, you need to know 
what each of them does. So the dendrites are the extension of the neuron that detects and receive information from other neurons. The axon is the single extension that transmits information to other neurons or cells. The soma is the cell body, which receives the information from the dendrites. And the myelin is the white fatty substance that insulates the axon, right? The axon terminals are at the very end, if you can remember from that picture before. And essentially, they um, have a little ball at the end, a, um, a knob. And essentially, that knob is the terminal button. And then what happens there is between that terminal button and the dendrites of another neuron, there is a synaptic gap. And that's where the neurotransmitters get passed across. So it's very important. Alrighty, does anyone have any questions about that? Most of you should know it from year 11, but still. Any questions? No. no. It's pretty self-explanatory on that one. You have done it before a thousand times, but still. Alrighty, so when we're looking at uh, neurotransmitters, the one thing that really you need to know off the top of your head is the role of glutamate and the role of GABA, right? Very important. You also need to know what neurotransmitters are, but still. So neurotransmitters are chemical substances produced by a neuron that carry a message to other neurons or cells. Um, they attach themselves to receptor sites. We're going to look at lock and key process, which is actually very confusing, but still. Um, and essentially, if they get passed across, then the neuron then keeps sending that message. If it doesn't, then it gets taken back out of the original neuron, right? So it's sort of like absorbs it, and they call that reuptake, right? So neurotransmitters that have an excitatory effect, right, um, are the glutamate neurotransmitters, and they make it more likely to fire, right? So the better the glutamate or the more glutamate that's released, the more likely the neuron number one is going to pass information to neuron number two. So the pre and the postsynaptic neurons will fire together. Gamma amino butyric acid or GABA, right, is the main inhibitory neuro neurotransmitter. Um, and essentially it makes the postsynaptic neuron less likely to fire. I like to look at it as go and stop, um, but it's a bit of a misnomer because even if you do have GABA, it doesn't mean that it stops it entirely. It just makes it very, very slow. So I like to use the traffic light one. I do recommend it. So glutamate go, um, GABA slow. So it doesn't necessarily say stop, it just slows. All right. The lock and key process is one that is very associated with neurotransmitter functioning. So essentially, with uh, the lock and key process, right, the neurotransmitter from the presynaptic neuron must match the receptor site on the postsynaptic neuron, right? And so the reason why they're called lock and key is because essentially you need the right lock, uh, right key for the lock. I tend to use this particular um, one here. So the neurotransmitters only affect receptor sites that have the correct shape of that particular molecule. So that means that if it doesn't, it gets reabsorbed back into the um, presynaptic neuron. GABA makes it less likely that the molecules will be received by the postsynaptic receptor site, so it slows it down. Doesn't mean that it stops it, it just means it's less likely. Glutamate, it, glutamate makes it more likely that the molecules will be received by the postsynaptic receptor sites. So glutamate sort of makes sure that the keys fit. Alrighty, does anyone have any questions? Lock and key is one of those hard ones. No. No. No? We're all good? Okay. Um, no, wrong one. Sorry, my apologies. Okay. We're doing okay. Not doing great. Not doing great. 
All right, Parkinson's disease. Um, essentially, I'm not going to go into too much detail about Parkinson's because it was in the holiday session. So if you weren't in the holiday session or haven't watched the video, you may want to um, look at this in a little bit more detail. Make sure that you use uh, the words a neurodegenerative disorder. Um, make sure that you mention the fact that it happens in the substantia nigra. Um, essentially, it is due to the um, reduction in dopamine and it means that you've got tremors because the dopamine actually um, sends those messages on how to control body movements. So less dopamine means more issues with the primary motor cortex. So the main symptoms, and these are the physical symptoms, tremors, uh, muscle rigidity, slowness of voluntary movement, and postural instability or balances, and walking disturbances, whatever. Non-motor symptoms are loss of uh, smell, sweating, fatigue, confusion, and panic attacks. GABA also is an issue because GABA is not being released, um, then there is a good chance that there is less dopamine being released is a whole big thing. I like to look at it from this one. I'm trying to include as many mnemonics as I can to help you out. So the signs of Parkinson's disease is a shuffling gait. So um, it's, you know, you're walking very, very slowly. Mask-like face, so it's very flat. Um, it doesn't show emotion. Akinsia, which sort of means that um, you'll have problems with bodily movements and, um, and balance, rigidity, so sometimes you just lock up and then tremor. So with Parkinson's disease, remember SMART. Shuffling gait, mask-like face, akinsia, rigidity and tremor. You lose marks if you say shaking. That's not what it is. You have to use the word tremor. Alrighty, so you can do the exam questions. I've gone through how it actually works. Um, have a look at them, they're very good. With the nervous system, you need to understand the different divisions of the nervous system, particularly the sympathetic nervous system. Um, remember the autonomic, uh, <coughs> the autonomic nervous system, and which is part of the peripheral. Know how neurotransmitters work and be able to explain the lock and key process. That lock and key process, you need to make sure you know it off by heart. Um, you also need to know this the motor and non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease and the causes, so dopamine and GABA. Alrighty, any questions about that one? Any questions? No, no, thank, no you. thank you. Okay. Alrighty, stress, which I'm hoping not all of you are experiencing, but hey, stress is stress. All right, stress, and you may remember this from the phobia um, topic, you need to make sure that you mention that it is physiological and psychological arousal. So it's both a bodily thing as well as a psychological thing. So it can be produced by internal or external stresses. Sometimes we put our own internal stresses on that don't exist, um, and you perceive them as challenging or exceeding their ability to cope. So you need to make sure that you have that definition down. A stressor is different to stress. A stressor is the stimulus that causes stress. So let's say, for example, you're worried about the upcoming exams. You're stressed about the exams, but the exams themselves are the stressor. So an internal stressor is something within yourself that causes stress, such as a personal problem. For example, your um, your um, beliefs in in how you're going to do, so you're freaking out, blah blah blah. An external stressor is something external, so having to study for exams, blah blah blah. Exam, very stressful. Um, you stress is something good. It's pretty pretty good i'd rather that one than anything else right so you stress um could be things like you have a holiday coming up well actually no, that would be more distress at the moment but 
you have a holiday coming up and you're really excited, but you know, you've got that nervous excitement, that's you stress, right? That's something that you, it's not affecting you negatively, it's a positive one, right? Um, it could also be you've won a million dollars, what next? So you start getting stressed about it, right? Distress is negative. So it could be anger or anxiety, um, it could be due to your um, exams or sacks, right? Too much distress or long-term distress can cause serious negative consequences on your health, right? You don't want that one. Um, so you need to know the sources of stress, right? It doesn't get asked as often in the exam, but it's always good to know. So daily pressures is a source of stress, essentially, you know, what happens every single day, um, things like you have to, you know, wash your clothes, but the washing machine's not working, that's annoying, which is my current problem, right? And it just, they build up. So let's say, for example, you've got to, you know, do your work for psych, you've got to do your work for maths, you've got to do all this work, and that's just daily pressures, right? Um, and the common daily hassles that you have, you can see there, right? Life events are another one. Um, so let's say, for example, your parents happen to be getting a divorce, you're getting a divorce. I don't know, most of you are legal age, you possibly could. Um, and so it could be those sort of things. COVID would be a life event. Um, marriage would be a life event. And these are put on top of your um, of your stresses. So think about it this way. Think of it like a glass of water. Your daily hassles that you have every single day, right? And your glass of water is only filled to, you know, three quarters of the way. And it's got in it, you know, study for school. It's got um, things like, you know, you've got to do your homework. You've got to do clean your bedroom, you've got to make the bed, you've got to do all these. These sort of things are in that um, glass on a normal day. Then something hits and it could be, okay, COVID hit. And that just gets plonked right into the water. And then that increases the level. And then you start putting in um, parents are getting a divorce and then that gets put in. And over time it becomes accumulative, right? So it keeps getting... Um, bigger and bigger and bigger and the water starts overflowing and that's when it starts to become you know too much to handle um acculturative stress is essentially culture stress so it's when you're trying to adapt to a new culture um and you're not necessarily able to speak the language you don't have the same religion right and it's stressful a major stressor is something that is out of the ordinary it just happens right so it could be a car accident it could be you know robbery terminal illness it's something you did not see happening right so it's a major stress right and you start having you know hyper vigilance panic attacks guilt social withdrawal anger all these sort of things and then you've got catastrophes and catastrophes once again you don't expect them but things like the bushfires Maybe you might even consider COVID catastrophe. I don't know. Either way, right? It's something where you cannot um, simply bounce back from. It is unpredictable event. It just happens and it's just caused mayhem everywhere. And there's suffering. The mnemonic I like to use, I didn't put daily pressures in there. Um, go count with a D on the end. Let's put D on there. There we go. All right, and I'll add it. Catastrophes, acculturative stress, life events, major stresses, daily pressures. So, there you go. I would recommend making sure that you know those ones. Does anyone have any questions? I'm going to go until 10.45 and then we'll stop. Any questions about sources of stress? No, thank you. No, no. Good, good. Do you like my new apartment? It's lovely. 
Alrighty. So, no. Alrighty. The flight, fight, freeze response. This question, 100 million trillion percent, which doesn't exist, will appear on the exam. There is no doubt about it. There will be a question about the flight, fight, freeze response in your exam. There is always a question about the flight, fight, freeze response. So make sure you know it. So the flight, fight, freeze response is involuntary. It is a physical response to a sudden immediate threat in readiness to either the flight, fight or freeze. Um, the, the flight and fight are both activated by the sympathetic nervous system. When it comes to freeze, the sympathetic nervous system turns on, but it quickly turns off, right? Because the whole point of freezing is that everything, you should just stop, right, in the hopes that you won't be noticed, right? So the freeze response, it starts off with the sympathetic, but quickly goes to the parasympathetic, and it goes to a level lower than normal functioning. So it really slows everything down. So um, the heart rate and breathing rate increases in the flight fight response. The pupils dilate, so they get bigger. So the black in your eye actually gets bigger. Um, and it allows as much light as possible. And the reason why it does that adaptive response to ensure that you see the danger as easily as possible, right? The blood is directed to the muscles, so it's preparing the body to fight or flight. When a threat is perceived, the signal is sent to the hypothalamus, right? And the hypothalamus um, is associated with stress. And it activates the sympathetic nervous system. So it goes to the hypothalamus, the sympathetic nervous system, and it happens so fast that you don't even think about it. It's automatic. The sympathetic nervous system then stimulates the adrenal medulla. Um, which then is part of the um, adrenal gland, and then it secretes hormones into the bloodstream. And these hormones are adrenaline, also um, epinephrine, and noradrenaline, called norepinephrine. I honestly don't know the difference between the two, just know that they exist. All right? The stress hormones activate organs, including heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, and result in bodily changes that characterize the flight fight reactions. So my advice when you're studying this bit here is to go, all right, flight, fight, freeze response, what order do they go in? So you might go, all right, to so do a flow chart. At the top, you've got the stressor, right? Threat is perceived, sent to the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus triggers the sympathetic nervous system or activates, let's use correct words, activates the sympathetic nervous system, um, then it triggers or act stimulates triggers right, the adrenal medulla and then in brackets adrenal gland secretes hormones and then you put in adrenaline noradrenaline and then activates heart lungs blah 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 i would do it as a flow chart that's the best way to do it because in that way you know okay this does this then this then this then this and that's the way to do it I always like to put in a mnemonic. So sympathetic nervous system, you've got the stress and it's a flight fight and the parasympathetic response, rest and digest. So peace. All right. If the threat is extremely overwhelming or an individual can't uh, run away, the freeze reaction may kick in. So let's say, for example, um, um, I'm going to say a Tyrannosaurus Rex is coming after you, right? You, you don't run, you can't fight it, right? You, their one step is like your 20, so you're better off just standing still. We won't talk about the fact that they can't see you if you stand still, right? If the, you're going to go into freeze reaction, so the sympathetic is going, oh my God, stress up. And then it, then it goes, no, 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 we can't, we can't fight or we can't fly, we need to stop and hopefully they won't see us. In this state, the heart rate and blood pressure just drop and your muscle tension just completely just relaxes, right? It is an adaptive value. A lot of rabbits do this as well. Um, if you've ever gone um, bunny bashing, but we won't talk about that online, um, 
you shine a light on them, as soon as they see that light, they freeze in the hopes that they won't be seen. So prey is less likely to be seen if it's frozen still, which is somewhat true. Um, and it's believed that the free state occurs when the parasympathetic nervous system just kicks in, which I've explained before. Um, cortisol is what kicks in after they've worked out that the hormone um, epinephrine and norepinephrine have not been enough. So the adrenaline is not enough, right? So the stress is still going. Someone's still chasing you. So cortisol gets brought in, right? And it tends to, um, it, it works, but too much cortisol is problematic. It is going to make you sick, right? It's not designed to have large amounts of cortisol. So the HPA access, so remember I talked about that flow chart before, right? HPA access, so the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and the adrenal cortex, right, is going to be the one that brings in the cortisol. And the hypothalamus stimulates the pituitary glands, which will lead, I'm not saying that, ACTH, right? And then that travels through the bloodstream to the adrenal cortex, which stimulates the, um, the release of cortisol. And the cortisol will energize the body and it'll provide you with blood sugar and metabolism, but it will decrease your, um, your immune system and it will make you sick if you have too much cortisol. And this is why a lot of you will actually get sick during exam period, right? You have so much, um, you know, exams after one another and again and again and again, not to mention the fact that we're going to have COVID um, restrictions at that time as well. It's still, it'll be on all year, right? You are going to have, um, you know, issues with illness and you're going to be more likely to get sick. So really get the sanitizer out on that one. So here we go. I have done the flow chart for you because I'm such a good person, right? You may want to copy and paste this because it's actually pretty good. Um, so this is that one that I was talking about before. And then if it's not removed, the HPA access kicks in. All right, so both of them are there to, um, to energize the body. Alrighty, I'm going to stop there because it's a nice spot to stop at um, and I need to actually be able to keep my voice. Does anyone have any questions about what we covered today? No. No. No? I know I went a little bit fast, but this is how fast I'd be going in class, if not faster. Um, all right, does anyone have any final questions about the upcoming SAC, which is next Thursday. Uh, what, uh, what, what time? Sorry? What time? What time? It? It'll be during class. Okay. okay. Well, at least that's what I'm hoping. Yeah, I think it's two, three, or four, or something like that. Yeah, because we have classes next week. We go back. So what's the point of doing it outside of class? Um, so we'll be doing it on the thursday what's going to happen hopefully i have everybody handing their hurdle tasks and i can mark them this week and then on the lesson before the sac we will actually go through the hurdle tasks um, answers and hope well as much as let's give you feedback um i just can't talk about the article Alrighty. Any questions? Any other questions? No? Yes? No? No. Okay. Alrighty. If you have no other questions, uh, oh, sorry, last one thing. Um, you do not have class on Wednesday, but I don't want you to miss out on exam prep. So there'll be a class on the Thursday at 2 p.m., which is our usual class time. Sorry, but I just wanted to make sure that you knew where everything was. Alrighty, so um, good luck on your GAT, which is on Wednesday. Um, yeah. All right, have fun, have a good day. And I'll see you next uh, on Thursday. Thank Bye. you. Bye.
Everyone, uh, bye, people. Bye, thanks, bye. bye. You're welcome, bye. Any questions?